I am... Um, I'm very happy to be here, I have to say, and also looking forward to the conference. I'm a little bit jet-lagged because I only arrived this morning, so if I, if, it, if I lose the power of speech, you'll have to forgive me, but I hope I won't. Um, I'm going to split this talk into two parts, and I fear it's going to take about an hour, but we'll see if we can cut it short if, uh, if I notice that you're getting restless. Um, I'm going to talk first about... Uh, the way that European journals, or three specific European journals, which I'll go, to, go into in a minute, have um, covered Asia um, over the last 40 years, largely in the most recent period, but also going back to the 1970s. Um, these three magazines, which we'll look at at the moment, have quite different histories and positions within the art world, um, but maybe they can be taken as, uh, as exemplary of certain ways in which the European mindset ha deals with the processes of globalization which have been going on since the colonial period, if not before. Um, then we won't literally take a break, but I will sort of draw breath and then talk about how um, after all, the, the journal that I founded together with the artist Mark Lewis in 1999, how that came about, what the thought processes were behind it. Um, and also Chong Dai asked me to, to talk a little bit about how we have developed and how that journal itself has um, uh, uh, the state in which it is today. Um, and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of, of both these processes. Um, so let's start with a short introduction to the three magazines that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Freeze, which I notice is actually a media partner of this event. So I'm not sure whether they'll remain a media partner after the end of this talk, but um, I, will, uh, I, I can't change the talk, so Freeze will be part of it. Um, talk about Art Presse, which is a, a, a journal published in, uh, uh, in Paris, initially in France, and then about 10 years ago, bilingually in English and, and French. I'll be using mostly the English examples. And uh, Flash Art as, a, as the third journal. Let me just make a short introduction to these three and then say why I selected these three. Um, so Freeze, for me, in a way, represents the Anglosphere, I suppose we could say, um, in the sense that uh, I was wanting to focus on European journals, though, of course, Britain is no longer really part of Europe anymore, so it's much more now part of this, uh, this Anglosphere of uh, reconstructing the old empire, which you'll be very familiar with here, of course. Um, perhaps a forlorn task. You might know that better than the British do. But, uh, but nevertheless, it feels as though it's quite separate, and I think we'll see some of that, the, the maybe in some strange senses, some indications of that separateness, indeed, in, in some of the ways that Freeze itself has covered Asia. Um, Freeze began in 1991, and I think fundamentally was a, a promoter of what was then called the Young British Artists, of course, no longer young. Um, the first journal, the pilot issue, uh, issue, for instance, had a butterfly of Damien Hirst on the cover, and in a sense, that was the, the genesis and the reason for it uh, initiating itself. Um, but it has moved from this relatively parochial um, but fairly energetic art scene in London um, to become a, a transnational, we might also say a tax-dodging corporation um, that is basically dependent economically on art fairs um, and are offering exclusive access to art um, for those people who can afford it. Our press has a rather different history. It begins in 1962, um, but, and, and really is a, a child of the 1960s, and certainly um, of Paris in 1968, and the kind of radical chic that followed it. It's particularly associated, perhaps, with Catherine Millet, who, is, uh, who became the editor in 1971 and edited it right through until um, this, uh, this century. Um, and it has, in the main, remained very much a French magazine. Um, a French magazine in the sense that it's been concerned to defend a certain idea of the critical intellectual within a European context, with an idea of European values of criticality. But also, I think, as a defender of the idea of Paris, as the inventor of modern art, and I want to put that in inverted commas because I don't think that we need to really discuss whether it is the inventor of modern art, but nevertheless, this claim that Paris makes to be the inventor of modern art, um, who are frustrated to some extent because their idea was stolen by New York, as they see. This is the sort of the famous um, situation that Paris is in in the post-Second World War period and is really carried, in a sense, by our press. The, both the intellectualism, the idea of criticality, but also this idea of somehow ground being lost. And I think we'll see this again in this coverage of, of, um, of Asia. And finally, flash art which is, um, again, surprisingly, I think, an invention of the 1960s. It was actually first published in 1967 um, in Italy, in Milano, 
um, but is very much, and again, we see kind of typically perhaps Italian construction, is very much a kind of family business of Giancarlo Politi, who was the, the publisher. Um, and I have to say that I never really read Flash Art until Chong Day gave me the opportunity to actually read it for this project. Um, and I, because I always saw it as simply a market journal, a journal which is produced in order to promote sales and, to, and produce the interests of the galleries. Nothing wrong with that. It just didn't seem particularly interesting from my you know, imagined position as a critical intellectual. Um, how, and it is very much imagined, yeah, but, uh, but nevertheless, that's the, the, the process by which I sort of rejected flash art. Um, but as we will discover in the talk, reading between the PR articles and the market promotions, there's actually something very interesting going on with flash art. And it's not necessarily to do with it being um, a more intelligent or more critical, but it's to do with a certain openness, which is not present in the other two journals so much. And so I really have learned to value flash art in a way that very much surprised me. So it's been a joy to do this research. Now, why these three journals? Well, I have to say it was rather more intuitive than scientific. Um, two of them have a long history going back to the 1960s, and it seemed interesting to think about how Asia was covered in, if you like, our prehistory, in a history of, late, of the late modern. I wanted to keep it to Europe, because that's where I'm based and where I'm from rather than go to, to the United States, for instance, because I think the present of Asia is rather differently felt there because of the different multiculturalisms that are in, that are in effect in, in, in the USA. Um, and these three journals felt different enough from each other, I've tried to sketch out some of those differences, um, to solicit some hopefully interesting results in the comparisons. I freely admit that it could have been other magazines, and I don't want to make any particular special claims for these three only. In a way, they are simply representative of the field. And I'm certain there's much more research into other European magazines that would reveal more subtle and perhaps even different results. But before I start looking in detail, I want to apologize in advance, given the topic of the conference, because I have to admit that the um, basic quantitative research and also qualitative research that we did, and for which I want to acknowledge the help of my colleague, Michaela uh, Alessandrini, reveals very much more about Western Europeans and British Islanders, and particularly about the differences between them, than it does about the Asian art scene. What we can observe here, I think, is how, in the main, white people imagine Asia and Asian art. Indeed, we could say that they, together with the Americans in this case, were probably the first ones to actually coin or use the term Asian art with any conviction. I'd like to add also that this, this has been a rather fascinating research project for me. Um, and I think as we go through this conference, I hope we will get a sense of what an analysis and an overview of art magazines can tell us about particular moments in the art world and particular developments that might otherwise be overlooked by art history. Claire introduced this idea of the hidden art histories of Asia. And I think that periodicals are places where, if you like, a snapshot is taken, a snapshot of a fugitive situation, a transitory moment before any canonization, before an art historical process of naming and shaming, of, of establishing the rights of artists or the wrongs of artists, has taken place. It's a, it's a moment in which art history might be emerging, but emerging only to disappear. And in its disappearance, maybe much is lost. So seeing these ideas in formation and, and in a sense touching through these periodicals on some of the fugitive atmosphere of the art scene at that moment in time is something that I think is very valuable. And my sense is, and I'm happy to be co uh, um, corrected for this, but my sense is that this is still a rather undeveloped field of study. And I did want to express my appreciation to Chong Dai for both focusing on this topic and for giving me the opportunity to look at it in my way and from my limited Western European understanding. So let's go to some of the information that we have. Um, and I'm going to look quantitatively a little bit at the, 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 um, the decades from the 1960s onwards and then look specifically at a few Project. So I'll go very quickly through this because it's, it's fairly obvious, actually. Um, we split it into Japan, China, India, and Southeast Asia, and other, um, including Korea, actually. So it's a little bit unbalanced. But um, what you see here is from the 1960s, there's almost nothing. 
one thing which is important to take account of. And um, it's only really our press that, that, obviously Freeze is not published yet, but it's only our press that deals with it at all. Uh, in some extent in China and in Japan, we'll talk about this a little bit, but it's to do with the radicalism of 1968. And what is being covered here, which we'll see, is very much a kind of, we could maybe call it a romantic Maoism, which is actually being addressed in these articles about ch uh, China. Um, the 1970s continues in that vein, but we start to see Japan becoming very dominant. And it's noticeable that Japan fades away as we go through time. So Japan is quite a strong presence. Again, here, particularly in flash art, it's the dominant uh, country in Asia to be covered during the 1980s. Um, and you see, again, Southeast Asia and India completely absent from any discourse in any of the journals. Here we go to the 1990s, so we're starting to have a, a freeze join. Again, India very little, only a small amount in flash art. You can see Japan, China obviously also because of population, and Southeast Asia, Korea completely absent. Yeah, we're already here up to, uh, 19, up to 2000. Uh, so, so what we're talking about in the main is a very recent phenomenon if we think about art history. The idea that, that Europe and Britain would, in any sense, turn its attention towards Asia is something which is only of the last less than 20 years. As we go forward, we start to see our press particularly taking an interest both in Korea, and there's quite a lot of coverage of Korea, but also of Southeast Asia, which I think becomes increasingly important as we will go forward. Um, Southeast Asia also strangely is absent from our press given the historic colonial relationship with most of Indochina, it's quite odd that there's no sense in which there's a cultural dialogue which continues after the independence mov movements at the end of the Second World War. Um, so France seems to remove itself culturally from an engagement with these countries. Also, of course, um, uh, Freeze not really engaged with India, which is its former colony as well, if we see these, country, these magazines as representing their states, um, but more so engaged with China, and this is between 2000 and 2010, so this is clearly about a kind of market responsibility. And here we have at the end, this rather over-dramatizes it because it's still a very small percentage in relationship to the rest of the journals, I have to say. Um, but nevertheless, you see that our press actually covering both Korea and, and particularly Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia becomes... Um, uh, certainly the second, uh, if not at some points, the, the, the most covered area in the journals in the last 10 years. I think this is where we see a lot of the growth, a lot of the attention. I would say having worked quite a lot in, in, uh, in Indonesia particularly, um, I think uh, in, in some senses where some of the most original collective kind of voices are being formed at the moment in Southeast Asia. And I think there's, of course, it's a huge... Uh, area, but uh, if we focus on Indonesia at the moment, I think there's something quite interesting going on there, and this perhaps reflects a little bit that interest which is emerging in that part of the world, um, difficult and, and challenging though it is. Um, and you see Japan really disappearing. Yeah? So what was originally um, the place where, if you like, the early forms of what we now call globalization, the idea of Japan as a first world country when the world was divided into first, second, and third worlds, that that, in a, in a sense, becomes by our current uh, decade, becomes something that's no longer so significant. So that just gives you a rough idea. As I say, this is never more than about 10% of the journal itself. So the attention that, we're, that, that are, is given to, to Asia is always relatively minor in relationship to its population, um, but is increasing. And I think we can anticipate that that, that increase will, will grow um, uh, as, uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as, as we go forward in time. Now, I'm going to start with Freeze. And I'm going to start um, by talking about um, the coverage that Freeze has done of Asian art, and looking specifically at a few examples, which I hope will sort of illustrate some of the changes in the response, but also the way that um, that British colonial instinct still lingers in the pages of, of this magazine, which would probably, as I say, as a sponsor, not be very happy with that idea. But, um, but nevertheless, unfortunately, or fortunately perhaps, depending on how you view it, it's, uh, it's present. Um, 
So as we have seen in those statistics, in the 1990s and early 2000s, priests did um, very little with one um, on Asian art, with one important exception that we will look in detail in a moment. Um, this was no doubt because it's a provincial British base and lack of international reach. It didn't have the kind of resources that it has now, but also because it initially saw itself as the critical voice of the young British artists' generation of Damien Hirst, Tracy Emin, Sarah Lucas, etc. When Asia was present, it was with Japanese artists only, even going into the 2000s. Uh, Miyajima, Morimura, Sugimoto, Yoko Ono were the artists that were represented at that point in what little Asian coverage there was. Um, in 2005, which we see here, is the first mention uh, of, uh, in the city reports, first was Singapore, and this is actually from Beijing, and then followed by Tokyo. And this was a, a section which was developed in Freeze uh, in the early 2000s, where they focused on particular cities and covered their, their art scenes uh, in fairly cursory terms. Um, in 2008, there was a significant change because Carol uh, Yingwa Lu, Carol Lu, um, became a staff reporter for Freeze, um, and her regular and thoughtful contributions uh, on China on the Chinese uh, situation um, have um, have remained uh, or, or, or still continue to be very important uh, broadening of the attention that Freeze has given. But the focus has remained fairly doggedly on China and Hong Kong and a little on India. It's only in the last three or four years, really, even though the graph showed the whole decade, in the last three or four years that Southeast Asia has come into the picture. Now, looking at the types of writing, I'd like to explore four texts to see the development over time. First is, as I mentioned earlier, this huge exception to the coverage of um, Asia in the 19, um, eight, uh, 1990s, um, which was a one-off contribution by Thomas McEverly. And Thomas McEverly um, is no longer with us, unfortunately, but was a very significant American writer, particularly significant around the time of the um, Magician de la Terre, for instance. I mean, he wrote many things, also, also on, uh, on uh, classical art. Um, but he was um, very sort of instrumental, I think, in creating a kind of context in the United States in which Magician, Magician de la Terre was received in a, in a probably less than positive way, but in a critical, critically interested way. Um, and his approach to um, a kind of global art theory is very interesting, I think. Um, he wrote in 1997 about um, the first Asia Society in New York, the first Asia Society exhibition on using contemporary art. And obviously, Asia Society has gone on to be a very significant player within New York and within the United States, which I'm not going to talk about very much. But it's become uh, very significant, I think, uh, in, in, uh, in introducing Asian art to that context in the United States. Um, the exhibition was called Contemporary Art in Asia, Traditions, Tensions, and was in a number of venues across the United States. Now, he, I suppose, essentially is looking rather more specifically at, at I mean, he's a sort of postmodernist, yes, uh, still, I mean, he's, he's not with us anymore, but uh, he was a postmodernist until his death. So he sort of remained within that context of what's happening, not necessarily after modernism, but what does modernism transmute itself into? And I think we're beyond that period now. I don't think that postmodernism is, is an interesting uh, topic for us to discuss now, but it certainly was at that moment when the modernist ideology was still fairly dominant, and that modernist ideology was, you know, as we, as we know traditionally, represented in a famous exhibition in 1986 in the Museum of Modern Art called Primitivism, where the roots of modernity might lie outside of Europe, but Europe claims ownership and uh, the originary capacity exclusively. So you have artworks that are being shown in the early 20th century inspiring artists like Picasso and Brach which those artworks are being produced, remember, at the same moment. Yeah? They're works from the late 19th, early 20th century um, that are being brought to Paris at the same time. They're not archaic works of art. They're works of art brought from Africa, being produced at exactly the same moment as the works of Picasso. But they're anonymous and not acknowledged and simply a source of inspiration without any context in their own place. That's essentially the modernist discourse which he was fighting against. Um, and, but what's interesting about um, Machiavelli, I think, is, is, is how, in, this, in terms of this relativism, and it's, and it's remarkable for Fries, how he talks about the exhibition and how he tries to describe what this Asian art might be producing. Because I think what he does here is start to predict, in a way, or start to recognize, not the postmodern, but this idea of the contemporary. 
And one of, one of my, uh, also sort of personal experiences, but also one of my thoughts is that really contemporary art is something that was invented in Asia. I remember that many years ago, when I first started working at the Guangzhou Biennale, which was in 2002, um, it was the first time that I came across somebody who said, I'm a contemporary artist, um, not in terms of I'm alive, <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of I have a certain kind of practice. And Thomas McEverly touches on this idea of a kind of practice here. I'd like to read a short section for you. He's reviewing the exhibition Contemporary Art in Asia Traditions Tensions. There were other types of work in the exhibition, including paintings and figurative sculptures. But for the time being, installation and found objects have become the primary means of the globalizing trend in world art. Marcel Duchamp seems to preside over the end of this century to an extent that he would hardly believe that a period of art history fueled by capitalism should be, should be signatured by the store-bought commodity seems appropriate. And installation art has become so iconographic that it does feel like a kind of international language in which ideas and attitudes beyond the aesthetic may clearly be stated. It is through this vehicle that the international art scene has become a wide-ranging conversation that crosses national and linguistic boundaries. Perhaps more than at any other time in the past, art today functions as a diplomatic network. This is 1996. A diplomatic network linking disparate cultures through acts of simultaneous self-discovery and self-revelation. It is actually performing a role, and a crucial one, in the social and geopolitical orientation that is still, de that is still dealing with the fallout of the end of the colonial era. And I think this article is remarkably foresightful that it actually, in 1996, already sees functions of art, which maybe to some extent we might take for granted now, but certainly were not very visible 20, 20, 20 years ago? Yeah, 20 years ago. Um, slightly more, 22 years ago. Um, but also, I think, in this description of installation art as being the art that has the capacity to be internationally not only recognizable, but translatable. Yeah, that the installation becomes the, 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 the form of art which can mix the Asian, the African, the Latin American, and the Western European, and whatever else I've missed there. Um, that that, uh, that in, in un identifying this, I think he becomes very close to something that I think, uh, at least in my experience, is true. And certainly when I say that artists in Asia, in, in, in this case in Indonesia, would say we are contemporary artists, they also in a sense meant they were installation artists. They understood that getting away from the, the traditions of calligraphy or the traditions of landscape painting or the traditions of, of shadow puppetry or whatever that were, that were encoded into certain kinds of traditional art forms was to become an installation artist. However much a Puppetry, a shadow puppet might also be an installation art. It wasn't at that time seen as such. That might have changed now. But at that time, it was an escape from the tradition was through the idea of installation. And that's, a, that's something, I think, which took um, the um, hegemonic powers within the West, maybe still, quite some time to understand how useful this idea of installation was to creating a kind of globalism. And I think McEverly really touched on this. So that's a positive example, and I think Fries can be very proud to have published it. I'm going to go to a slightly less positive example now, I'm afraid. Um, because one of the things that recurs in Fries, um, particularly in Fries, actually, is um, uh, the dispatch of staff writers to Asia in the periods 2006, 7 to 2000. 15 or so, not so long ago, um, to write reports, often collective reports, as this one is. You can see it does three biennales in two pages, um, that sum up this idea of Asia as being a th an entity, as being a, a place which can be captured. Now, we, of course, argue very rightly, I think, that Europe is not a continent at all. It's a subcontinent of Eurasia. And there is no such thing as a European continent or a continental form of thinking. If, if Jakarta and Vladivostok are in the same continent, then how on earth Paris isn't also is absurd. Yeah? So I think this idea of Asia is, 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 is something that we need always to interrogate. And I'm sure you're doing that much more than at least is being done here. But this idea that you could 
given the Asian definitions that we have or the Asian boundaries that we have, sum up the whole of the continent in a couple of pages is something which is, let's say, let's say at the least, ambitious. But what happens, particularly in Freeze, particularly in this British journal, yeah, when this summing up happens is, I think, quite interesting. Because what we go back to is a kind of search for authenticity and the dislike, a little bit of a contempt, for art which incorporates the modern, Western, global, contemporary sets of values. Let me give you an example, because this might be good. And I, and I think this is a little bit unfair. This is a writer, Christy Langer, who's, I think, based in Berlin. And I would stress that I don't think it's her. This has gone through a whole editorial process in a journal. You know, so there's a, whole, there's a collective voice behind this, which finds this to be reasonable. But let's have a look. This is from this article. At one point, she says, a few of these works, she's talking about the Singapore Biennale at this point, a few of these works signaled a discouraging trend. The artistic documentation of people in underprivileged countries learning to perform songs from the West. In adjacent rooms, first Croatian children, Croatia is apparently an underprivileged <laughs> country, Croatian children were learning an English song, providing both the content and the soundtrack of the work, leaving the artist with curiously little work to do, as though I should feel obliged to wilt at the sound of their wavering voices. The second, in an adjacent room, was a two-screen video of four men crunched on a carpet in a small hovel in Pakistan, rehearsing the American anthem in a cacophony of bagpipes and clarinets. <laughs> Apparently, the old trope of translating Western culture to less developed countries hasn't progressed much since the 1980 film The Gods Must Be Crazy, when a Coke bottle drops from the sky into the middle of Africa, and we're all asked to be entertained by the results. That was published in 2006. So you have to ask a little bit about the editorial process that's going on, I think, there. I mean, standing here in Hong Kong and reading that, it's embarrassing for me. And I didn't write it. I would like to listen to it. If I had, I would have been, it would be, would be rather a shame. Now, this is not about an individual. This is about a language of, um, of traveling to an exotic other, which is understood as an exotic other, and through that process of going to an exotic other, interpreting it for the folk back home, if you like, in this annoying way. Let me say also that in this article, and it is, it is significant, um, there's, a, there's a team of curators under Fumio Nanjo who do the Shanghai Biennale. It's the first one in 2006. She mentions only Fumio Nanjo and none of the others. Yeah, so there's also then a sense in which they, 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 they were all Asian curators. Um, there's a sense, again, in which there, there's something distasteful about it. I mean, I'm not going to labor the point. Just leave it there. I, I have to come back to another uh, example from this article. I'm sorry, but it's, uh, it's hard to avoid. And I do think I'm being a little bit unfair, because it is the worst of the bunch. But nevertheless, it does exist. Um, she goes on to talk about the Shanghai Biennale like this. The Shanghai Biennale brought to light another problem inherent to the Biennale format. Was the exhibition for the locals or for an international audience? Notice that those two don't meet. The locals cannot be international. Yeah. While Singapore's Biennale included only 12 artists from Singapore out of nearly 200 participants, the Shanghai Biennale, she's moved on now to the Shanghai, appeared to be under a strict remit to give Chinese artists pride of place. Unfortunately, the Chinese art in this show, with few exceptions, stood out for its literalness and lack of subtlety. Literalness and lack of subtlety. I'll come back to that. <laughs> overproduced and over overproduced and overwrought works, such as Wei Ching Tu's museological display of fictional artifacts, took up three rooms with its de demonstrative light box displays, threatening to upset upstage subtler efforts, such as Paul, Paul Ramirez Jones's The Missing Note a string of bells programmed to play the Chinese former national anthem with one note missing the note corresponding to the word happy. Just pause here for a moment to say that apparently it's perfectly OK for Paul Ramirez Jones to use an Asian song and to reinterpret it. But it's not OK for, 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 um, artists, for Western songs to be reinterpreted by Asian players. Where's, there's something going on there, no? I mean, there's something in the mindset there 
Again, I don't think it's her. I think it's a, a system which we need to question. In the same way, the attempt to create an air of officiousness surrounding the Biennale with marching police squads, tight security, this comes back time and time again. You'll have to take my word for it. There are so many descriptions in Freeze of the opening ceremonies in Asian Biennales or Asian exhibitions and how exotic, appalling, and, and interesting they are. So with marching police squads, tight security, and planned giant screen projections of opening night speeches backfired when works were censored. The opening banquet was abruptly cancelled because of rain. <laughs> yeah? And the security detail refused to let some of the artists into the opening. There are no mention of the curators' names in this article. There is barely any mention of the artists' names. It's not only Christy Lang. I have to give you another... The, the, just the consequences of, a, of another description of the exoticism of the opening ceremony, which he, uh, which he felt uh, Dan Fox, writing in 2007, so the year after, um, felt was um, you know, both, both uh, charming and inadequate and, and uh, um, um, uh, um, preposterous, I think, all at the same time. And he said at the end of this description, he says this. So, I mean, he does know about it, you yeah? If the above description makes me sound like just another stupid Western gaijin, an outsider or foreigner, dumbstruck by culture shock, then mea culpa. It, in all the events I've been to, I've never witnessed anything quite like it. It looked so much fun. So you see this process of trivialization that is going on in these, in these, in these articles of staff writers being sent to Asia. Now, things do get better, and I'll round it off by saying that things do get better. But it's interesting also that Guangzhou is recalled. They, they also, she also talks about Guangzhou in this article, you can see from here. Talks about it being an unremarkable city, um, therefore ignoring its past as a city, which was the foundation of the resistance to the, military, the US military dictatorship at the time. Um, and um, it's interesting that the only curator that she mentions from Guangzhou is the one European uh, curator in the whole team of about 10 or 11 people. It's almost a caricature, this, yeah? It's almost, I mean, in a sense, for me, it was like finding, finding gold dust in the, in, the, in the journal in a certain sense. Not that I was looking for this in a critical sense, but I, but I said I was surprised by flash art. But uh, you know, reading this, I, you, you, you suddenly think, okay, where is this coming from and how is it coming from? And I think this is what is interesting about looking at these journals, because these things would nowadays be edited out. They would no longer, because they were published at the time, and they have this snapshot quality, we can actually see what lies behind them now. But this is almost an in-character, char and it's important to realize that it was, it was 11 years ago. Um, and this was part of the way that Asian art was understood, dissected, and disseminated by one of the main Anglo-Saxon journals, we have to say. Now, I want to just briefly, I hope it will be brief. How am I doing for time? Um, I'm not sure I'm going to get it all done, so, but I'll, I'll tell me when I need to stop. Yeah? Um, I want to compare it briefly to an artist who we might come back to at the end of the talk, um, Rashid Areen, who wrote this in the first issue of Third Text, um, which is uh, an important um, journal. I think um, many of you will know this. I haven't looked at Third Text because it would be rather absurd to look at Third Text in terms of Asian coverage because that's part of its remit. Um, but I think it's interesting to compare what we find in Freeze in 2006 with Rashid in 1987, so nearly 20 years earlier, uh, complaining precisely, I would say, about this same issue. In order to stand, understand this complex issue, the relationship between Europe and Asia in this case, one has to understand the difference between the Orient and the modern, the former being a category of primitivism, which can enter the latter but only if it is transformed through the consciousness, which according to Hegelian philosophy, is an attribute of European people only. And I think this is where this text, however unconsciously, yes, it's not, it's not about the woman who wrote this being, being bad, uh, please, but it's about the fact that unconsciously, this inheritance of a certain mindset in which the originary force is a European force, and so, therefore, to subvert a Western song is not something which is permissible, yet to take an African sculpture and construct cubism on the basis of it is something which is not only lauded, but is seen as an originary force in itself. It's seen without the citation, whereas the Western song is seen only as citation. 
This is what Rashid goes on to say. There is no contradiction here. The consistency of the Western bourgeois worldview is the consistency of the philosophy of modernism. It appears to me that the terms of reference of modern art as a progressive force unfolding continually on the basis of Hegelian dialectics of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is not available to the colonial other. The, the thesis represents an authority. And so we start with a thesis which is already an authority, which is the authority of the West over the world. And it seems that this authority can only be challenged at a particular time in bourgeois history within its own terms of reference and through what Hegel would call the world spirit. It is therefore understandable why the access to modernism is blocked whenever the colonial other appears in front of it, because the difference between the primitive and the modern is fundamental to this Western authority. So in other words, this thinking is not, as I say, a product of um, a childishness or ignorance. It's a product, it's a systemic product. It's a product of a particular way of approaching modern, and we might say postmodern, because that's included, I think, within the modern art. It's why in, in other talks and in other, in other versions of myself, I would talk about the demodern as being one of the most urgent categories that we maybe need to construct, because modern itself is fundamental to Western authority. The idea of this difference, yeah, the difference between the colonial other, between the primitive and the modern, is not only the prerogative of academic philosophical discourse, but it is part of the collective consciousness of Western societies. I'm not suggesting here that this necessarily represents a pejorative attitude of white society towards non-European people, or that it is exclusively part of it. Often this difference is invoked in a positive manner, and we think about the idea of spirituality, for instance, as being a way in which the spirituality of the other is far greater than the spirituality of the Western consumer subject. So often it's invoked in a positive manner to appreciate something that is missing from dehumanizing Western culture. It so happens that the ideological implications of this difference, whether positive or negative, are not often or commonly understood. 20 years later, I think we can say they were still not often or commonly understood. And I think that while there are changes, and Carol uh, uh, Yu, for instance, is an important example, um, that, that those changes are, um, are still in process, let's say that. Yeah? That, they're, that. They're in process, and I think by analyzing these texts, if you like exposing, speaking this out, then we can get further than if we bury this. So it's done in a spirit of positivism also towards the British Islanders, yeah? <laughs> in the spirit of positivism, to say that if you accept the set of ideological constructions that lead you to write something like this review, then you can find a way out. If you don't accept them, that's a far more problematic position. So the critique is not meant, as I say, to be precisely directed at Fries in a negative way. And I'm going to rescue Fries right at the end by saying that in more recent times, as a, apart from Carl Lu as well, there have been valuable correctives to the sort of wide-eyed innocence come colonial master approach that we see here. Um, uh, they have, for instance, covered more generously individual Asian artists, such as Hegu Yang here, um, Though they are, I have to say, mostly artists that have already been mediated by, by European or North American institutions. Um, this shift is, however, real and is perhaps even more apparent in the article on the right hand side by Gary Zhejiang, which shows at least that the neo colonial tone, which we heard before, call it neo colonial, we could call it many other things, but let's stick to that. The neo colonial tone uh, is, has been replaced by more nuanced voices. At the end of this article, here, which looks at, um, which is called Where Next? Imagining the Dawn of the Chinese Century, um, there's, there's this comment, which I think is, is, uh, is, 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 is important, a bit like the Thomas McEverly in Freeze, that there are, in any journal, there are balancing elements to it. And it's about sifting through this and trying to understand where it comes from. The interesting thing here, of course, is this is an artist um, based both in London and, and in, in, uh, in Beijing or a writer who um, who's, has a direct experience, yeah? is, is, I wouldn't want to use the word native informant, but at least is somebody who has a different kind of ideological makeup, ideological installation in their thinking than that that seems to be dominant, that Rashid Arine pointed out is dominant within 
Western education systems. This is what he, he ends up saying. Speaking via WeChat, the Shanghai and Berlin-based artist Ai Jiao dismisses Sino-Futurism. The technological and economic hardware might be emergent, but the problem, he argues, is that contemporary China lacks a prevailing theory of modernity. Without an indigenous methodology, Sino-Futurism orbits around a Euro-American planet, manifesting either as a diasporic fantasy or a nightmarish return of the colonial repressed. Whether or not the 21st century turns out to be China's, a new set of global conditions is emerging. What is at stake in Sino-Futurism, that's what he's been writing about in the article, as a dream, as a nightmare, or as an impending reality, is not only the decentering of Euro-American cultural hegemony, but also the narrative of futurity as a historical, modern aesthetic, which China might recast in its own image. As RGO stresses, such a, philosophy such a philosophical undertaking will require time and reflection. Sino-futurism is hardly a utopian project, but it presents a geopolitical opportunity. How might Orientals take control of the narrative of Orientalism? I think that that's a really interesting question to end this section um, on. But I, but I have to say that Prezes, uh, this is a personal thing, of course, we just have in the museum where I work in, Van Ava Museum, we just have an exhibition of Rashid Arin at the moment. And uh, I, it's easy for me, because we've been working with him quite closely, to understand his ongoing frustration and anger at the British cultural ecology. And I'd just like to conclude by saying that Fries will not be reviewing Rashid's show because they feel they've given enough attention to him and to the issues he works with already. Um, I would be rather doubtful of that, but there you go. Um, that's Fries. Uh, carry on. How long? 20. Great. Um, so we'll do our press, and I think, I think we'll, we'll hopefully get beyond our press as well. So I'm going to talk about our press, which was started in 1962 um, and really came into its own, I think we could say, um, after and during the um, May 68 Paris uh, um, revolution that wasn't, but nevertheless, that stimulated a lot of social change, if not political change, in the subsequent decade. Um, this, I would say, is an example uh, this is, I'm not going to translate it, but you can see a certain head poking out of the water there. Um, there is this kind of romantic Maoism, um, which is uh, how China is dealt with in the 1970s. And by the end of the 70s, completely disappears. So in the 80s, which coincides, I suppose we could say, with the Reagan-Thatcher move, with the, with the dominance of a new kind of neoliberalism, with the idea of the evil empire, which I know was directed at the Soviet Union, but kind of included communism in all its various hues and cries, um, that, that, uh, that essentially following that, and obviously journals are very sensitive and following developments, not only within the artwork market, but within the geopolitical context in which they're publishing, then China, the romantic Maoism is no longer sustainable, and there's nothing else to report about. So the whole emergence of a political generation uh, of artists before 1989 in China is, is, is left completely uncovered. This is not something which is addressed at all. Um, and it really doesn't really come back until around the middle of, this, of the first decade of this century, so around 2005. And from 2008 to 12, the main focus is on China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, and then gradually, Southeast Asia comes in, as we've seen before. India, hardly at all. The, the main article on India is actually a review of uh, Nalini Malani's exhibition, which is a recent exhibition at Centre Pompidou, which is part of their, we were talking about, part of their Asian strategy, um, which has then resulted in, in this exhibition of, of Nalini Malani, which is a, a, a great exhibition, an important thing to have. But I, in a sense, it's not really coverage of what's going on in India. It's simply a reflection of what happens to be available to them in Paris at that time. Um, it is quite interesting, actually, the Milani Review is notable in the context of the colonial voices in Frieze, for instance, um, and, and also Christy Langer, but maybe other people's disdain for these Western songs sung by underdeveloped people, um, both Croatians and Pakistanis in this case, because it cites Milani's Western theoretical influences without embarrassment. In other words, there isn't an attempt in this article by 2017 to say that whether it's Heine Müller or Simone de Beauvoir, that this is somehow shameful for an artist from India to be using these Western sources. So when at one point looking for, for if we generously say looking for authenticity, then this is something that shouldn't be allowed. At this point, it's now expressed without any, any, uh, any embarrassment. 
Um, though it does place, and this is also, I think, interesting in the fact that uh, Milani's exhibition, well, Milani was chosen as the exhibitor, it's because she was educated in Paris. So there's still this idea that you can kind of claim a certain originary aspect to the Parisian context. Um, but I think also it's important to say that, that uh, the writer is a, a South Asian specialist. I haven't got a photograph of it, actually. But, um, the, the, so it's rather than a, based in Paris rather than a staff writer for, for our press. And I think that's the same with, the, um, with uh, the, the, the Freeze articles, whether Thomas McEverly or, or um, uh, the last one that I quoted, which actually um, are done by uh, academics not working directly for the journal. Um, we do, uh, I have to say, though, also in our press, find this idea of difference as, as of between the primitive and the modern, as talked about by Rashid, constantly returning. In 2016, for instance, Juliette Soulez, writing a review of Hegu Yang, um, speaks about her work in the following terms. Then in 2013, after a retrospective at the Strasbourg Museum of Contemporary Art, Hegu Yang quite unexpectedly started making sculptures of a rather playful type in artificial straw. This series, The Intermediate, is currently on show at the Hamburg Kunsthalle, often juxtaposed with the artist's trademark mural colleges in a rather decorative, surrealist style. These sculptures are inspired by tribal art from around the world. This new series refers, not unhumorously, to the figure of the shaman and animistic beliefs, but also to the Korean craft. Having explored the West in her previous work, Hei Yu Yang is now looking more to Asia in a new experiment with alterity in relation, this time, to her own roots. So Asia is, what does it say? Inspired by tribal art and rather playful types in artificial straw. It's, it's again, problematic. Yeah? And, I, and I think, again, it's the same thing that it's important to pick these moments out, because if we don't pick these moments out and interrogate them, then we're never, then we're never actually going to be able to, uh, to, to overcome them. So again, it's not about critique, it's about, um, I hope, for the interests of us all. Um, and what's interesting about our press is that its focus, and it's particularly a focus on, on, on China and the market, is, is very focused on the idea of the, the threat and perhaps also the opportunity that the Chinese market and the new money offers. There are two long articles from 2014. Um, uh, what I have done is actually missed, but I'll, I'll miss this. This, which I'll return to, is, is, is actually quite an important um, review of um, Magician de la Terre by Nicolas Bourrien in 1989. And this in the period between the Romantic Maoism of the 70s and the Chinese art market of 2005 onwards is the only time really where Asia art appears in the journal at all. And it's through this exhibition, Magician de la Terre, which I was going to try and talk about a little more, but I think I'll skip it because it will, it will, it'll delay us and you're probably all familiar with it. But it's obviously this very um, seminal exhibition which didn't produce any children. <laughs> it's very interesting in, in the sense that what happens in 89 is this exceptional moment where there's an idea however flawed, uh, an extraordinary ambition of an idea. And I congratulate John Hubert Martin, the people who put it together, for the ambition of trying to do that. It, it allowed and allows us still today to talk about globalism in art, critically, of course, but to talk about it in, in a certain way, which if it hadn't existed, would sim we would simply ha not have access to it. Done in a crucial year, 1989, which of course we all know what that represents here, but it represents many other things all over the world. Um, this exhibition is, is, um, uh, is not picked up at all in the 90s. The 90s is a story of young British art, of the, the Nordic miracle, of the Polish miracle, of various Euro internal European discourses related to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, and the opening up of certain parts of, of, uh, of Europe. Um, the, if, if you like, the dismantling, the beginning of the dismantling of the West. I think we can no longer talk about the West in any meaningful sense anymore. But that's, that period of the dismantling of the West already begins after 1989, and this is what is focused on. So the offer of Magician de la Terre, and perhaps it's simply because it coincides with a huge geopolitical change with the end of real existing socialism, that is, is not picked up until 15 years later that this globalization, is, that there's a jump. And you see this in all the journals. Yeah, there's a moment where there's an attention, and then it goes. 
So that's why this sort of seminal without children seems to be the best description of it, because the children, or the children come very late. They, 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 he's an old father by this point, or an old mother by the point uh, he has children as an exhibition. This is Hegi Yang, and this is the one that I was talking about with China. Um, yes, and the, these two, this one and the next one, are um, the articles I want to make reference because they, I think what they illustrate, um, before I read them, I'll, I'll just, I think they illustrate the kind of feeling of, um, I think what art press occupies, which is what I tried to say at the beginning, is this position of the critical European intellectual, which is a position which is, of course, very valuable. Um, but at the same time, one which claims this originary force, this authority of the West behind it, and therefore needs to be undermined, needs to be unpacked in terms of what exactly is the critical position that is being adopted in any particular occasion. Because criticality, of course, is valuable, not sufficient, but necessary, I would say. Um, but the critical intellectual in the tradition the Hegelian tradition, if we like, as Rashid would call it, that that tradition is no longer able to encompass what we're talking about. I think our press is still the kind of defender of that position. Yeah? If, 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 um, if Flash Art, which we'll see later, is the defender of a kind of market position, our press is defending this critical intellectual position, and it feels threatened by things which don't fit within the discourse of that critical intellectual. So, what we find often is this idea that money, and the Chinese in this case have money, the Russians also appear, but it's largely the Chinese in the art press case, actually, and we look across the world, that money doesn't come with good taste. You know, that good taste is a product of something other than financial resources. Um, and so we see in 2014 a critique of things like K11 and various other um, projects of, of, uh, of um, uh, museums in, uh, in, um, in, in, in Asia, um, including M+, plus, I think, actually, um, that, uh, where they say there, um, there seems, this is from Carolyn Hartuk, who I believe is uh, uh, living here as well. Um, it's a very short quote and not very critical, so I'm happy about that. Um, <laughs> she says, there seem no pre-existing models for this museum's arm race in this referencing the ambition to build 3,500 museums in China between 2010 and 2015. I believe that was anyway surpassed, quite, but quite considerably. Um, and few projects seem to have long-term prospects. So this idea of the museum on, on the basis of this, this, um, this, the longevity of a European philosophical tradition, and which goes back perhaps to Kant, we could say, that the longevity of that tradition is something which is juxtaposed to this superficial, as we often, we again saw in this exemplary uh, text by Christy Lang, this idea of literalness and, and, and surface of the work, is also extended to the institutions, which are both literal and superficial, and that they don't have long-term prospects like the museums that we had. So the way to defend the idea of critical intellectual in 2014, at least, was to say, ah, yes, you can re reproduce the model, but she does say that there is no real pre-existing model, so it's a more thoughtful uh, response than I'm making it out to be. But nevertheless, in general, this idea of reproducing the model of a Western museum, but without the sense of it having uh, uh, an eternal ambition, which museums actually do, they buy work for eternity, it's a completely inhuman time scale, but nevertheless it's the time scale that operates at the museum level, um, that, this, the, that, that the protection of the critical intellectual is precisely this tradition going back to the 18th century, perhaps even further to the Tigris and Euphrates, which aren't in Europe but still part of the European tradition, that, that this, 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 this sense of a, um, of a, 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 year, a, a longevity is something which is not available to the new museums here. Now, I think we could discuss that, and there's no doubt this is not an unnuanced point of view. This is not a point of view that, that we need to dismiss, but nevertheless, we need to understand where it's coming from. But it's interesting that by 2017, so last year, the threat has rather grown, because not only is it about the institutions in Asia developing, growing, but without roots, in a sense, without the possibility of sustainability, as is understood, but by 2017, 
This is the comment. With there, this is the Asian, um, particularly Asian individual um, uh, uh, collectors and, and the power of the Asian market, Chinese market in the main. With their considerable financial resources, they place culture at the heart of China's socioeconomic developments. And in diplomatic terms, the role of influential Chinese figures at major international museums in the Guggenheim, in Centre Pompidou, and Tate Modern, whose goal is to constitute sizable collections also shows how the process of promotion has been reversed. Foreigners, we're thinking about Uli Sig and people like this from the 90s onwards, foreigners are no longer the only ones investing in the recognition of Chinese artists. Increasing institutionalization is, is one of the key trends in the evolution of artistic practices in China, but not only in China, also for Chinese art outside of China. More generally, Chinese cultural renewal is being taken seriously by the government. And this no doubt explains, and this is very interesting, this no doubt explains the increasing campaigns to repatriate despoiled cultural artifacts. So at this point, what's being pointed at is actually all this stuff that we have in Western Europe might get sent back. And this is the fear now. So the fear is, is, is no longer about these institutions not having the gravitas or the roots or the sustainability, but they might get their sustainability precisely from tapping in to the resources which have been conquered, which have been stolen in many cases, no? during the colonial period. And then they say, witness Francois Pinot's restor restitution of the bronze animal heads in 2013. If we consider the revival of national spirit, it is easier to measure the alternative role played by contemporary art in this avalanche of projects. And then he talks about Hong Kong and M plus and these institutions as being pivotal to this shift in China's relationship with the cultural world. And then ends, the question remains, is the Chinese contemporary art scene truly based on international practices or is that merely a fragile appearance? And I think that's a very useful question, actually. It's a question that we could all seek to address and to, and to, and to consider. But perhaps in this idea of fragile appearance, we might hear the echoes, shadows of the echoes, if that's possible to have, shadows of the echoes of the superficial, the literal, the not subtle, that marks out the critique of non-Western art and the idea of primitivism in the first place. The idea that what Asian artists, art institutions, cultural support systems just don't have the stamina or the depth to keep themselves going. Yet there remains definitely a shift in the kind of threat that is perceived in our press, in this idea of the critical intellectual. And I think, again, speaking for myself, that it's a threat that is actually very valuable in the process of undermining the modern, questioning the modern, in order for us to build a world where I would say Europe should become a place rather than the place rather than giving itself always priority, understanding that it can play a role. Because one of the things that we see, not only in the art context, but also in the geopolitical uh, realm, is that Europe, Europe's unhappiness at losing its dominant position results in either an attempt to reassert it, and here we could also see the United States in its white manifestation, white supremacist manifestations currently, yeah? which is basically European. Donald Trump is very much a European, I think, um, that, that, uh, that, that we see either this sort of rather violent and vulgar restatement of the authority of the European narrative, what Rashid's talking about, or this tendency within Europe to completely withdraw, to withdraw and say, we don't want to be a part of the world. And to become a part rather than the part seems to be the task. So this analysis, I hope in some way, in some small way, might aid within the art world to trying to come to terms with that. Have I got time to do flash art? Five minutes? You can do it very, 10. 10, okay. I'll do it quickly. I won't get to after all, but I mean, I hope it's been interesting anyway. No, not too many people have walked out, so. <laughs> um, I, um, so flash art was born in 1967. And it has uh, a couple of reviews um, from, uh, from the Tokyo Biennale, actually. This review here, I don't know if you can read it. It's extremely short. Um, and, and in some ways, it's the most charming art review I've ever read. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, I'd, I'd select a, a small section of it um, where it says, um, 
well, well, it provides an example, and then he goes on to say that the choice in the exhibition could certainly have been vaster or even narrower. Many artists are not present, while some of those present can be considered as superfluous. But it does not matter. The Biennale has a physiognomy, a character, which no one can deny. And it becomes an example for all other famous and prestigious exhibitions should be taken from Tokyo. And that's kind of a little bit the sort of the quality of flash art that I so admire, in a certain sense, in actually discovering it. In the sense that it's actually something that has a kind of openness. You could never imagine our press saying this, because it wouldn't be the critical intellectual position. Yeah? Nor could you imagine Freeze saying it, for other reasons, which I'm not quite sure why, but you still couldn't manage it. Yeah? Um, but, or imagine it. But, but here you have this idea that even though, and it's very nice, it says that this is reviewed, it's based on the catalog. So they never went to Tokyo. They just knew the catalog. <laughs> But reading the catalog, and if you look at the artists here the, at the bottom, you can actually see the Italian artists, including Richard Serra, which I think is a mistake. The Italian artists are in, uh, in bold, because it's an Italian magazine, um, which is sort of very nice. But I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, this is in 1970, when attitudes become form, and Oblosse Schuva, which is a fundamental exhibition uh, pair, uh, happens that, that acknowledges for the first time a kind of internationalism in art in a certain way which is no longer part of national schools. Again, a long discussion which we've dealt with in exhibition histories. And after all, that's in 1969. Yeah? So in 1970, this is not only that internationalism which extends more or less from New York to Vienna. Yeah? That was the internationalism of the art world until into the 2000s in some ways. Yeah? Um, but um, uh, the, the internationalism that we see here is actually more generous in 1970 than certainly a Rudy Fuchs documenta uh, would have been in 1982, yeah, some time afterwards. So this, al this allowance, I think, for this exhibition, which I'm, I know a little bit about, um, is, uh, is, is something we, I think it's, it's very, would be very interesting to, to study this further. Um, also in the 1970s, we, we see uh, Nam June Pai. Um, but however, from 1996 and the years following, Flash Art commissioned and published far more writers, critics, and curators working in Asia to speak about their work and their, their engagement with the art field than any equivalent international art magazine. I have to say, as I said, this is something of a surprise to me because I imagined it only as a marketing device to ga uh, galleries, but I'm very, I'm very delighted to have my prejudices, prejudices both exposed and corrected here. Um, so starting in 1996, and it's interesting that Hu Hanru, who writes this article in 1996, we're really one of the first surveys of the emergent Chinese art scene in the mainstream Western magazine, publishes it in flash art, not in our press. He's living in Paris at the time. So you would imagine that if there was an access to the, the journals that he would have, the first one would be our press, which is the major French language journal, and he speaks French. Um, but he gets it published in flash art. And I know from talking to him that, that that was the only place where he could get it published. The rest of the, rest of the, the journal simply weren't interested in 1996 in this kind of article. And it's interesting that this is then revisited in, um, this, these are another couple where you see um, people like Puja Sud or Yuka Hasagawa simply asked to write um, a, a survey of their own positions fairly consistently. Um, so this text, we'll just go back to it for a moment, uh, was uh, revisited, sorry, here are other ones uh, about Bangladeshi artists, for instance, and this uh, later on in around 2007, Indonesian art. These kind of documents are actually incredibly valuable now if we look back at them, certainly in comparison to looking back at any other journals, at least of these three journals that I've done. Obviously, there could be others, and Third Text, for instance, would be an exemplary of another kind of discourse, but these are the mainstream journals that we've got here. Um, Obviously, continuing always, I'm going, trying to go quite quickly, continuing always with the idea of uh, the promoting the galleries, promoting the sales, being very much attached to the market. But somehow what we see here, and this is against my sort of leftist instincts, of course, but we see here that the market actually allows a kind of openness, which either the critical intellectual or the kind of British colonial approaches of the other two magazines simply doesn't allow, simply doesn't permit to happen. So simply thinking, OK, well, what's interesting in terms of sales. Let's go to those places and let's simply invite the people who are active there to publish in our journal. Actually produces for us now records of what is going on, which are far more effective than we could um, expect from those other places. Um, 
Now, I'm going to just um, quickly go back to the, very quickly go back to this one. Sorry, to ambivalent witnesses. And just, and just do two quotes, one from this and one from a, a, a text 20 years later, which reflects on it. So, who Henry begins by outlining the challenges in 1996. At the present moment, this is how he talks about ch uh, uh, Chinese artists. At the present moment, Chinese artists, uh, China's artists are facing a number of new tasks. 1996. Firstly, how to surpass the historical limits of the radical and revolutionary avant-garde movement of the 1980s, which is completely ignored by the European journals, which was essentially ideologic-centric and politically engaged. I did have to correct the English, actually, in this article. Um, secondly, the so-called post-1989 art, including political pop and cynical realism, has been so fondly accepted by the international market and institutions as an object of post-Cold War political exoticism that it becomes a seductive model for many artists longing for success. How to resist such a seduction and refuse to become prey to international ideologues' fantasies turns up, therefore, to be another emergent challenge already in 96. And the third major concern, and probably the most important one, is how to react to the shifting reality of China's economic, cultural, and political life in the recently accelerated modernization. And I think Hanru, who later on did Cities on the Move, which I think is an important exhibition, again, like um, Magician de la Terre, an exhibition that we can take different positions around, but certainly marked the moment where this accelerated modernization is dealt with in a Western context, also in Thailand, um, in a particular way, in a way answering his own question here. 20 years later, Wang Zhao Yu ends her text with an answer, maybe an answer, to some of, uh, have I not got it? I fear I haven't got it, I'm sorry. But I, you're going to have to take my word for it, <laughs> that it's written. And um, she, she uh, ends it with this, which I feel is, is maybe a quite an appropriate end. Um, in 1996, that's the year that Henry wrote his text, she writes, in 1996, unwilling to produce work that necessarily would be mediated by the market or curatorial agendas, Chan Wei Kang of the New Measurement Group left the art world. A year prior to that, the group dispersed and shortly thereafter destroyed all records of their collective works in response to the threat of their practice being mainstreamed. This is a group that was formed in... The, um, in the 1980s. I've got five minutes, so I might go on after this. Ultimately, in 2009, another member, Gu Jet Dekshin, also stopped producing art as a total denunciation of the fully neoliberalized art market in China. If the imperative of art is to imagine the whole of life, this is in flash art. Yeah? If the imperative of art is to imagine the whole of life, believing such imagination can free us from the general drift of the world, and ultimately, to redirect it, then such beliefs become ever more urgent today. Art always situates itself as a social antithesis, and such a position compels it towards a rich and productive unreasonableness while in solitude. The untenability of this unreasonableness, yeah, the, the unsustainability of it, the untenability is the implication of, uh, uh, of the artistic as such. If the discourse, Chinese contemporary art, in inverted commas, is already mainstreamed, then perhaps the dissolution of this concept will mark the beginning of a different kind of contribution to global art and intellectual discourse from the art communities of China. We are not there yet, but we can aspire to it. So in a way, what she's saying here, if I'm from my white male Western perspective trying to dissolve the Hegelian discourse that Rashid spoke about 20 years ago as being the authority without which we cannot act as, as white Europeans, then what this is suggesting is that Chinese contemporary art kind of performs that same function and needs to dissolve itself in order for the same process to happen here. And maybe in this dissolution of the modern, of the modern in terms of Western Europe, and maybe United States, and the contemporary, in terms of Asia and China, in this disillusion, because if the, if the modern was invented in Europe, let's imagine that the contemporary was invented here. In this process of dissolution, which is what we get in this extraordinarily interesting text, I think, written in response 20 years later, in this dissolution, we might start to produce something where we both become places in a plural world. And I think I'm going to end it there, actually. Thank you very much.